the Nazis are in their final days, and a lone, forgotten bridge crosses the last barrier between the approaching Americans and Germany itself. Americans surge onward, eager to be the first to cross the Rhine, while a few badly outnumbered and outgunned Germans are given an impossible task. This is the story of the Ludendorff Bridge and the chaotic battle which took place between March 7th and March 25th, 1945. While some are honored as heroes, others are unjustly round up and executed. Using eyewitness testimonies, we reconstruct the events moment by moment, a battle which was not to have happened, and caught both American and German high commands off guard. The Mulheim Bridge stands firm in Cologne, German troops moving to and from as the Western Allies continued their approach. Those in charge of the bridge know that within a few months the Allies will be in the city, and the bridge would be used just as they were doing now. Explosives have been placed along key structural points across the bridge to be ready to explode at a moment's notice, the second American, British, or Canadian troops made their approach. Cologne has been hit hard by bombing, and the German bridge command continued their work as air raid sirens begin to ring. They all look up as civilians and soldiers alike start taking cover, the roar of American bomber engines approaching. Explosions begin in the river, then creep their way closer to the bridge, water shooting upwards as American bombers zero in on their target. One perfectly placed bomb hits the bridge, exploding, sending the explosive charges up with it. The Mulheim Bridge going up in smoke, bits of metal shooting in every direction. And the bridge collapses into the Rhine River, destroying a vital bridge for the German war effort in the West. On October 15th, word arrived in Berlin of the bridge's accidental destruction. Adolf Hitler, still reeling over the failed coup and assassination attempt in July, grows furious over losing such a vital piece of Germany's means to transport troops towards the Western Front. In reaction to the bridge's accidental destruction, he orders those responsible at the bridge command arrested and court-martialed. Other bridge commanders watch in horror as fellow officers doing their duty are round up and arrested. They await for Hitler's new orders, which arrive quickly. Explosives are only to be placed on the bridge, and the bridge destroyed, at the last possible moment. Bridges already lined with the proper explosives were now derigged, and the commanders watched with fear, knowing they now need to worry about not just the rapidly approaching allies, but also their own officers and SS fanatics. Germany's ultimate surrender would not happen for another couple of months. Until that time, the Nazis were determined to fight to the bitter end. The infamous Battle of the Bulge, Hitler's brainchild and last-ditch effort to drive the Western Allies back, has failed miserably, draining much of their already dangerously low levels of resources. From the east, the Soviets were pushing rapidly towards Berlin. To the west, the other Allied nations were at the Rhine, planning their own invasion of Germany. Hitler, with his determination to continue the war and Germany's utter destruction, knows the Western Allies plan a massive invasion across the Rhine. It is his decision that every bridge leading across the river be destroyed. One by one, all German bridges going from the West Bank to the East Bank are blown. In many cases, the Allies even help them in the destruction, utilizing their superior air power in the hopes of trapping as many German units on the Western Banks as possible. By March 1945, Hitler's orders had been carried out almost completely with the exception of one railroad bridge. In a town called Remagen, the Ludendorff Bridge remained standing, the lone bridge still connecting the Rhine's eastern and western banks. What would transpire here has been debated about since its occurrence. Nevertheless, the battle about to ensue, no one on either side planned for nor expected to ever happen. It was an accidental battle, one which happened so quickly that both German and Allied high commands were unaware of what was happening until well after the battle had started. This is the Battle at Remagen. The Western Allies knew crossing the Rhine would be necessary to take the fight fully to Germany. Thus, General Dwight D. Eisenhower and his staff began drafting operations for such an invasion. Eisenhower had a good inkling as to what Hitler would do, judging by previous engagements throughout the war. There was no doubt in his mind that once the Germans withdrew across the Rhine, 
Hitler would give an order forbidding any retreat, just like he had done time and time again elsewhere. This had two elements, one good, one bad. The good news was that Hitler's dogmatic defense strategy would mean tying down thousands of German troops and thus a higher chance of encircling them and eventually annihilating them. The bad news was that this was no longer foreign territory for these soldiers. This was now Germany these troops were fighting for. Eisenhower, along with other generals like Patton and Bradley, knew it was going to be a vicious fight despite the fact that the outcome was written plainly on the wall. Nazi Germany will fall and unconditionally surrender. It was just a matter of time. People such as Patton desperately wanted to invade across the Rhine and make a mad dash to places like Berlin, specifically to seize it before the Soviets could arrive. But this would be tough. If General Eisenhower was good at anything, it was understanding the important need for logistics, as we will see later at Remagen. Allied supplies, though much more abundant than the Germans, were stretched thin. In order to maintain a proper offensive, supplies needed to be stockpiled better. And the troops were exhausted. Many had partaken in the Battle of the Bulge and had marched almost non-stop since then. A truly fatigued soldier is never a great thing on the battlefield. Interview with General Dwight D. Eisenhower. So um, we began to plan the basic, or what you might say the power crossing of the uh, Rhine, for a crossing just to the north of the Ruhr. This would be in the, uh, in the uh, zone of the 21st Army Group under uh, General Montgomery. And uh, to that force, I had attached the 9th Army under General Simpson to uh, reinforce uh, Montgomery's blow. This plan gave considerable frustration to the American leaders. America, after all, had around three times the number of troops on the field as their British and Canadian counterparts. And once again, Eisenhower appeared to be cowtailing to the British, which he had done previously with the disastrous Market Garden. Interview with General Omar Bradley. There was considerable argument as to how we should cross the Rhine when we reached the West Bank. The British argued, particularly Marshal Montgomery, that we should cross only in the north and make our attack north of the Ruhr toward Berlin. The maximum number of divisions you could supply on that narrow front was something like 25, but he wanted to take these divisions and let the rest of us stay on the west bank in a defensive position. The Americans argued that that was no way to do it, that we should advance on a broad front so that the Germans could not concentrate against us on a narrow front and with a broad front, we'd have better mobility and uh, could uh, probe and secure the places where they were weakest. General Bradley's U.S. 12th Army groups were to support Field Marshal Montgomery's 21st Army Group in attack north of the Ruhr, the industrial heart of Germany. Montgomery, therefore, was to have the main effort to drive into and over the Rhine River with the Americans protecting his right flank. Bradley then broke his plan of operations into two axes when crossing the Rhine. So that uh, my plan was to cross the First Army just south of the Ruhr, and the Third Army under Patton to cross down somewhere near Koblenz, and then join them together and attack to sweep around the south and east side of the Ruhr and connect up with the Ninth U.S. Division, which at that time was under Monty, on the east side of the Ruhr, and then clean up the Ruhr. By 1945, the Western Allies had been slowly fighting their way up and approaching the Rhine River, and forming a steadfast and formidable offensive line for their own broader front. Much of these German forces, members of the 5th Panzer Army and the 15th Army Group B, were undermanned, undersupplied, and exhausted, and had only recently been reorganized that they were, quote, sufficient to offer stubborn resistance to Third Corps. Such rapid reorganizations were common in the German army at this time, often leading to unintended gaps in understanding and communications. Often German soldiers were unsure who was actually their commanding officer, or even what division they belonged to anymore in the first place. During the West Third Corps' attack, they quickly discovered that they were far more mobile than their German counterparts, despite the fact that the Germans having significantly more artillery on their side. And eventually they punched a hole in the German lines and threatened to encircle the German 15th Army. 
At this point, the Germans' main concern was not necessarily to drive the Allies back, as much as slowing them down as much as possible to give other German forces more time to continue retreating across the Rhine. It was during this time the true story at the Ludendorff Bridge begins. In command of the Ludendorff Bridge was Captain Willy Bratka and Captain Karl Freisenheim. Captain Freisenheim was in command of the engineers, while Bratka was in command of the bridge's defense. As of March 6th, Bratka only had 36 men as a security command, and most of them were invalids, unable to be used on the front lines. The day prior, the original general in charge of this sector, Lieutenant General Walter Bosch, inspected the bridge's defenses. Rightfully, he was appalled, seeing as most of the 36 men were already wounded by either bombing raids or other fighting. The only other defense the bridge had was an anti-aircraft gun and its crew. Bosch promised Brodka that he would send a battalion of men to help defend the Ludendorff Bridge, but ultimately, higher command turned down his request. And before Bosch could do anything else, he was reassigned, and now command of this sector fell to General Otto Hitzfeld, Bosch, angered by his rapid reassignment, had no time to properly inform his replacement, who had little time of his own to deal with Remagen. After all, the defense of Bonn was a higher priority for the German forces at this point. Like so many other Germans, they were too preoccupied with the immediate dangers directly in front of them, especially seeing as the German lines continued to collapse more and more with every passing hour. With communications and command structure in such a disarray, not many knew or could even comprehend just what danger the Ludendorff Bridge was in, and no one really cared. German communications were in chaos, and it didn't help that OKW was not near the front lines at all. OKW, and Hitler especially, had no proper understanding of the situation on the Western Front, and not only gave ridiculous and impossible orders, but ones that often contradicted each other, depending on the Fuhrer's mood. As with the Eastern Front, what existed to the Germans on paper rarely ever matched reality. Soldiers were deserting and surrendering left and right. Supplies to keep trucks and tanks fueled were almost non-existent. Most soldiers on the front lines were no longer veterans, but young and old men as a part of the Volkssturm. To say the situation was dire is a total understatement. It was early afternoon for General Otto Hitzfeld. As of March 6th, he was in the middle of fighting a rearguard action against the Allies further west of the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen. This man was exhausted, constantly trying to contain a rapidly deteriorating situation while still putting up as much of a fight as his scattered and disorganized forces could possibly muster. At his HQ, Hitzfeld received a telephone call at around 1 o'clock in the morning, where he received a new command. He was to take over the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen, despite being miles upon miles away and having no inkling as to the situation there. As Hitzfeld explained, quote, This was an insane decision. You don't put a commanding general in charge of a bridge while he's still far away from that place. Totally baffled by OKW's decision, he pondered what it was he was supposed to be doing. Not only did Hitzfeld not have sufficient forces to actually head towards Remagen, but he himself could not abandon his current post to better understand the situation. Hitzfeld at least understood that German troops were still withdrawing across that bridge, despite feeling uneasy that it remained standing. He had confidence that the engineers there would destroy the bridge the moment the last German troops made their way to the eastern banks. Nevertheless, these were his orders, and he did have to do something about it. In comes Major Hans Scheller, one of Hitzfeld's adjutants, and a young officer. Scheller volunteers to head towards Remagen to take command himself, thus keeping Hitzfeld where he should be, further west keeping up his rearguard action. Scheller received instructions to, quote, keep the bridge open so long as there was a chance for German troops to withdraw across it to the east, but to destroy it the moment the Americans stepped foot on the bridge. With this, Major Hans Scheller made his way to the bridge, which proved more of a problem than anticipated. There were no available cars to properly transport him there, and the ones available were out of petrol, or were all but useless at this point anyways. He grabbed the nearest bike and began pedaling towards Remagen at around 3 o'clock in the morning, along with a small radio detachment. Along the way, the radio detachment either got lost, or they flat out deserted 
leaving Major Hans Scheller completely alone. The American forces nearest to Remagen had been basically assigned to a mop-up duty. They slowly made their way up the Rhine River, mopping up as much German resistance as possible. What many of these soldiers did not expect was a surprising level of resistance, not in a massive counterattack or dogged defenses, but instead small pockets of four or five men. In particular, machine gun nests and snipers constantly plagued the advancing American soldiers. After the Americans captured the town of Mechenheim, not too far away from the Ludendorff Bridge, both the 14th Tank Battalion and the 27th Armored Infantry Battalion were given their new assignments. They were to continue towards Vermagen and mop up any resistance that they happened to come across. Lieutenant Carl H. Timmerman of Company A of the 27th Armored Infantry Battalion, along with A Company of the 14th Tank Battalion, were tasked with this objective. The resistance they met along the way was scarce, though they did run into a few Panzerfausts and some roadblocks. However, these obstacles were easily dealt with, especially with the few new Pershing heavy tanks with their 90mm guns A Company of the 14th Tank Battalion had at their disposal. To say Timmerman had just been promoted to lieutenant is an understatement. On March 6th, his company commander was wounded and needed to be replaced. This was a common problem throughout the Western Fronts, as Germans became quite adept at picking off the green lieutenants within companies. Timmerman was anything but green when it came to the army, and he clearly knew how best to handle these Germans' pockets of resistance. He also took place in the recent Battle of the Bulge, where he barely escaped capture and murder during the infamous Malmedy Massacre. During the battle, he was also wounded, but remained to fight with his men. Before heading into Remagen, his Company A ran into a decently defended German roadblock. Timmerman personally led a flanking maneuver, taking the Germans from the rear and clearing the way for further advancement. So this man, despite only recently being promoted to a lieutenant, was no fool, and he had good experience fighting the Germans behind his belt. After a few more minor skirmishes with limited U.S. casualties and a lot of German prisoners, Timmerman's forces continued to trudge their way closer to Remagen, traveling mainly through wooded areas surrounded by several steep hills. Captain Bratka stands on the eastern side of the Ludendorff Bridge when he notices several German soldiers retreating. They approach him and report that the Americans are much closer than they had anticipated. Some even claim that they had seen enemy armor, specifically the Pershing tanks. Shocked by this, Brodka immediately goes to Captain Freisenhain and his engineers. Neither man knows anything about Major Hans Scheller, nor that General Bosch had even been replaced, though they held out hope that Bosch's reinforcements would arrive before the Americans could get too close. Freisenhain reports that they need more explosives to properly destroy the bridge, so Bratka sends out a request for 1,300 pounds of military-grade explosives, which would be enough to properly collapse the Ludendorff Bridge, after which both men sit and wait, the Americans getting closer, unable to do anything but sit on their hands and remain put. It is here that Freisenhain decides to place some explosives at the western edge of the bridge, where they can be blown, creating a deep crater that would impede any American armor from crossing the bridge, thus buying them more time. However, this crater was not to be made until the last possible moment in keeping with Hitler's policy. In the least, this crater would buy the engineers further time to properly place the explosives on the crucial points of the bridge. When they arrived. Even if the explosives arrived and were placed, there was the question as to who would give the orders to blow the bridge up in the first place. Captain Bratka and Freisenhain found themselves in a precarious situation in more ways than one. They absolutely could not blow the bridge too quickly or too late. If this happened, no matter what, Hitler would have them court-martialed and shot. And this helps explain the almost impossible position that these men were faced with. They were damned if they do and damned if they don't because of the catch-22 nature of the orders they were given. Earlier in the morning, Timmerman and his Company A began moving out. They experienced very little resistance heading into town, but moved cautiously. Along the way, they discover many houses, farms, and even entire towns with white sheets hung outside, showcasing the German surrender. This was becoming more and more common as the Americans got closer to Germany. 
Nathan Whitman, a soldier in Patton's Third Army, describes the situation best. Quote, there was no laughter in Germany. The civilians were all kept in their homes and the soldiers out. I guess they had enough of fighting. They were starving. It was something to see. You go into a city and there were groups of soldiers, with their guns on the ground, standing in groups of five or six, with their hands on top of their heads, waiting to be taken in and fed. Timmerman and his men were rapidly approaching Remagen, not expecting to find much. After all, they knew that there was a bridge there, but they expected to find it blown up like all the other bridges they had come across thus far. Three additional tank companies were now ordered to take Remagen, then continue their sweep south to link up with Patton's Third Army. These men, nor did the entire American army, understand what was about to unfold before their eyes. Captain Freisenhain receives words that the explosives have finally arrived. He is overjoyed with the news and immediately has his men gathered to begin placing the explosives and setting up the charges. However, when he arrives, everyone is horrified and angered by what they have been given. Less than half of what was requested actually arrived at the Ludendorff Bridge, and on top of this, they were not military-grade explosives. These were standard industrial explosives, which were predominantly used for mining. With the clock continuing to tick and their backs almost literally against the wall, Freisenhain decides to place a majority of these explosives at the western end of the bridge to detonate once the Americans begin making their approach. The rest would be placed along crucial points of the bridge. Meanwhile, the Ludendorff Bridge remained alive with panicked civilians having no other way across the Rhine River. The bridge was literally their only way to get into Germany, as Allied air raids had previously knocked out the docks, which could have been used to ferry civilians across the river. So not only are vehicles and soldiers trying to make the mad dash across the bridge, but so are countless numbers of civilians. All the while, Freisenhain and his engineers were desperately trying to do their work, and Brockout was continuing to try to gather a sizable enough defense force. Major Hans Scheller, after traveling all night, covered in sweat, uniform disheveled, arrives at the Ludendorff Bridge. Brockout and Freisenhain immediately run to greet the Major, and it is quickly explained that Scheller would be taking over command of the bridge. At first, Braga was ecstatic, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One, he no longer had to worry about giving the order to blow up the bridge. Responsibility now came solely down to Major Scheller. Two, since Scheller had arrived, that would mean the reinforcements that General Bosch had promised would be arriving soon. However, this quickly vanished, as it was apparent that Major Scheller was not from Bosch, or even the command Braga thought they were still under. In fact, Scheller had no inkling of the reinforcements arriving, which meant nothing was on the way at all. Interview with Captain Willy Bratka. About 11.15 a.m., a major in general staff uniform arrived and introduced himself as Major Scheller. Major Scheller told me that he had orders to take over command at Remagen. At that moment, I breathed a sigh of relief because I thought, now we will get the promised additional battalions. My first question was, where are the battalions? Major Schurler looked at me in surprise and asked, which battalions? Now it was my turn to look surprised, and I almost suspected that something was not quite in order. Schurler asks what is available for a defense, and Bratka explained the best he could. I had at my disposal, in the bridgehead of Remagen, one sapper company of 125 men. The sappers were assigned to the planking of the railroad bridge in order to make it passable for motor vehicle traffic. The men had to work day and night in order to complete the bridge. Besides these men, the bridge defense company was also under my command. It consisted of 35 men, convalescents, all of whom were still under treatment. Some of these men were not even able to manipulate a gun because, of course, they had stiff limbs. There was also a single battery of a new type of rocket launcher the Germans were developing, the Henschel HS-297. 
However, they were ordered to withdraw to the eastern side of the Rhine and to destroy the weapon in the face of an enemy attack, so those were utterly useless. Scheller was horrified because on paper there should be at least 1,000 men ready to defend this bridge. But like most things in 1945 Germany, they did not exist, but instead vanished. Many of the few defenders Scheller now found himself in command of were young boys and old men, many of whom were already wounded and in no shape to put up a dogged defense. The Americans begin attacking the western side of the town. Many of the German defenders had never seen an American tank before, let alone the new Pershings. This might help explain why they hesitated at first to open fire at the oncoming Americans. This hesitancy actually served the Germans well, as when they finally opened up, it caught the Americans completely off guard. So much so that the Americans actually fell back and decided to wait for the M4 Shermans and the four Pershing tanks to truly arrive. This also bought Brodka and Scheller some time to quickly formulate what to do. In terms of blowing up the bridge, there were a few things Freisenhain had devised. There was the standard detonation with cables which led into the mouth of the tunnel on the eastern side of the bridge. If this failed, there was a fuse which could be manually lit on the bridge itself. All three men just had to pray the explosives they had been given would be enough to actually collapse the bridge. If they were to blow up the bridge now, thousands of civilians and hundreds of wounded troops would be stranded on the western side of the river which is exactly what the Americans wanted. Rodka began trying to persuade some of these Volksgrenadiers to stay and help defend the bridge, but most flat out ignored the captain and kept making a run for the tunnel. The Americans had begun their offensive again, this time with the tanks nearby. Those German soldiers garrisoned in the town quickly began to vanish, most flat out deserting or surrendering without much of a fight. Soon, the Americans would be in a position where they would have a great vantage point over the German forces, as they would have the high ground on the western side of the river. Scouts from the 89th Reconnaissance Squadron arrived on the hill overlooking Remagen. From all accounts, these men were utterly astonished by what they found. A runner was sent to Timmerman, along with Lieutenant John Grimble, who could not believe what they have just been told. He had to see this for himself, so he was guided up the hill overlooking Remagen. Immediately, he is struck by the amount of commotion going on nearby. Clearly, the Germans were up to something, and desperately trying to move a great number of people as quickly as possible. Once they crested the hill, they stood slack-jawed, seeing one of the last remaining bridges still standing across the Rhine. Littered with panicked civilians and wounded soldiers, there stood the Ludendorff Bridge. Both Grimble and Timmerman's first instincts were not to rush down there and take the bridge. Instead, Timmerman grabs a nearby radio and orders artillery to fire upon the bridge in the hopes of blowing it up, as they had done with other smaller bridges along the Rhine. However, most of these bridges were not railroad bridges, specifically designed to handle large amount of troop movements and heavy equipment. Nevertheless, the Americans begin their bombardment while many Germans were still on the bridge. Timmerman also radioed into their task force commander, Lieutenant Colonel Leonard Angerman of the 14th Tank Battalion. Angerman was just as shocked as Timmerman and Grimble and rushed to Remagen to see the bridge for himself. Once on the hill with Timmerman, Angerman looked down at the bridge with his binoculars. He got a good look at how panicked and desperate the German situation was. Angerman took Timmerman and ordered him to start moving his men into Remagen and to take the Persian tanks with him. They would need to take small winding roads from the bluff overlooking the town. Timmerman obliged, running down to rejoin his company and get moving, the Pershings not far behind. The bombardment had begun, and Brodka remained on the western side of the bridge. Here, he was trying to direct the traffic to keep it flowing as steadily as possible, time quickly running out. He was lucky that the bombardment was not worse than it was, as Timmerman had ordered the artillery pieces to use proximity fuses. However, the gunners were unsure just where the other American positions were. They did not want to accidentally fire on friendly forces. Word soon reached General Hoge's desk of the discovery at Remagen. Like Timmerman and the others, the news of such a strong bridge still standing across the Rhine got him in a tither. 
and he and much of his staff began flooring it to the scene. Hoge began doing the math in his head, the dots connecting. If he sent men across the bridge, he might lose a battalion. If he sent men across the bridge and it exploded, he might lose a platoon. But the rewards of taking that bridge. Hoge says to Angaman, I want you to get to that bridge as soon as possible. Hoge had formulated a plan in his head, not one thought up beforehand or written by committee like so many other military operations. This was spur of the moment, unplanned, clumsy, and he knew it. But the rewards of taking that bridge outweighed those risks. Hoge had made his decision. The Americans were about to get their bridge into Germany. The pandemonium on the bridge had only exacerbated the confusions for the Germans. People were screaming and shouting, and no one knew where anyone was. At one moment, Brodka was on the western bank, only to be leading and directing civilians on the eastern side, leading into the railroad tunnel. Scheller, too, was moving in and out of the tunnel, trying his best to corral some sort of fighting force because he knew the Americans could be here any minute. Reisenhain, looking for Brodka, got closer to the western side of the bridge. To his horror, he could see American soldiers and tanks approaching from on top of the hill and through the town. He quickly got a few of his engineers and, without orders, detonated the explosives at the western end of the bridge. This created a deep, 30-foot-wide crater, achieving its intended goals. No enemy armor vehicles would be able to pass onto the bridge without the crater being filled. This would buy the Germans a little more time. Timmerman was making his way steadily through the town, facing little resistance. They had also come under some fire from guns placed on the towers overlooking each side of the Ludendorff Bridge. But overall, the resistance had been shockingly light, and suddenly the earth was trembling, an explosion sending dirt, rocks, and debris high into the air and crashing down upon them. It was Freisenhain's crater, and the tanks came to a halt as they continued to fire. Freisenhain, thinking the time was right to destroy the bridge, began running across to the eastern side. American artillery and tank fire was raining down all around him, huge splashes of water raining onto the bridge, people screaming all around him. And suddenly he was flying through the air, the wind knocked out of him, the concussion of an American artillery round exploding just beside him. Freisenhain hits the metal floor of the Ludendorff Bridge and was knocked unconscious panicked soldiers and civilians trampling over him in a last-ditch effort to escape. Meanwhile, Timmerman had moved up ahead, and he could see several Germans in a panic running to the eastern side of the train tunnel, and he knew these were engineers getting ready to blow up the bridge. However, the machine gun fire from the bridge's defenses, now almost exclusively on the eastern side, was heavy. The terrain certainly benefited the defenders. The lead-up to the bridge was made up of mainly narrow passageways, making it easy to, quote, canalize the attackers along the existing road. Brodka had been smart in understanding the importance of the two towers on the eastern end of the bridge. There, he had placed two MG-42s, which continuously poured heavy fire upon the approaching Americans. Remember, the MG-42s, even if they were not many of them, could fire up to 25 rounds per second. With the German gunners constantly firing small bursts into the funneled Americans, they could do quite a bit of damage. They weren't called Hitler's buzzsaw for no reason. Fifteen long minutes had passed since Freisenhind was knocked unconscious. He began to stir, was probably shocked to find himself still alive, especially with all the machine gun and artillery fire going on all around him. Brodka was watching from the eastern side of the bridge, and provided some cover fire as Freisenhain made his way to them. It was quickly becoming more difficult as the Americans began firing phosphorus shells, creating a thick smoke screen. This would hinder the Germans' ability to keep the American troops pinned down. By a stroke of luck, Freisenhain made it to the eastern side of the bridge. As the artillery barrage and tank fire grew in intensity, the pandemonium within the cave grew worse. Inside the railroad tunnel were hundreds of cowering civilians, many of them women and children, even some livestock farmers had brought along as a means to provide for themselves. Wounded German Volksturm were also present, many of them as young as 16 years old, or in their 60s. Meanwhile, American soldiers approaching the bridge managed to capture someone claiming that the German engineers were planning to blow up the bridge at 4 o'clock p.m. 
No such order existed. But could the Americans really take that chance? The interrogators looked down at their watches and saw that it was nearly half past 3 p.m. now. They needed to relay this information quickly if they wanted any chance of taking the bridge whatsoever. Lieutenant Timmerman was blissfully unaware of this, nor the plans General Hoge was formulating to actually cross the Ludendorff Bridge and establish a foothold across the Rhine. Nevertheless, he got word that it's believed the Germans will blow the bridge at 4 p.m., which corroborated what he was seeing on the eastern banks. Captain Bratka knew the Americans were getting closer, and was moving up and down the cowering Volksturm and volunteers to help further defend the bridge. None were budging, greatly frustrating the captain, though he also understood. These were not fighting men. He was asking the impossible for an impossible situation. Having enough of seeking help, Bratka left the tunnel and made his way towards the makeshift barricades set just outside the eastern tunnel. He finds Captain Freisenhain and a couple of engineers setting up the charges to blow the bridge. However, they needed written permission to detonate the explosives from Major Scheller. Germany's rigid emphasis on bureaucracy and hierarchy made this necessary. However, Scheller was nowhere to be seen. Was he dead? Was he in the tunnel and Bratka had just missed him? Was he on the other end of the tunnel? Had he deserted? No one knew. Scheller was eventually found, and both Brodka and Freisenhain begged him to destroy the bridge. Scheller immediately agrees. Freisenhain then goes for the charges, but Brodka halts him. He insists on getting the orders in writing. Again, this sounds so arbitrary, but remember Hitler's treatment of officers who blew up bridges either too soon or too late. Admittedly, Brodka was thinking of saving himself and his men by having the orders written down and signed by Scheller. Scheller knew this is what was happening, and luckily agreed without much protest, despite Captain Freisenhain's justifiable impatience. A lieutenant began writing down the orders, and Scheller signed the paper. Brodka then ran outside and began hollering to Freisenhain, Blow the bridge! Blow it! But now it was Freisenhain's turn to hesitate. If he blew the bridge, it would be his neck on the line, as if it wasn't already. He fell back on OKW's orders, which he personally had received earlier, to have the orders to blow the bridge personally delivered to him and visually seen. But there was so little time. Knowing it would be his neck on the end of one of Hitler's nooses, Captain Freisenhain puts the keys into the electronic detonator to blow up the bridge. He twists it, ducks for cover, nothing. Panic begins to settle in, and he twists the electronical charge again, turning the key, and... nothing. He tries again. Nothing. Freisenhain knows exactly what has happened. During the American bombardment, the circuits had been severed. With time running out, he immediately began searching for his engineers, trying to gather a repair team as quickly as he could as the MG-42s from the towers continued barking away, and the American artillery shells exploded all across the hillside and above the tunnel. The Americans would soon get soldiers onto the bridge and establish a breachhead on the eastern banks, the worst-case scenario. Freisenhain then calls for a volunteer, knowing full well that whomever it was would probably be killed. A lone corporal steps forward. Corporal Anton Faust. Freisenhain orders him to run onto the bridge and manually light the fuse to the primer cord. With this order, the corporal dashes onto the bridge, machine gun fire all around him, the smoke making it hard to see, German machine guns firing overhead to give him cover, American bullets ricocheting off of the bridge's metal beams. Brodka, Scheller, and Freisenhain watched with anticipation, but soon found that they could not see the corporal through the thick smoke. They had no clue if this boy would make it or not, the artillery fire continuing, guns still blazing, bullets whizzing by overhead. All the while, Lieutenant Carl Timmerman remains with his men close to the crater made by Freisenheim. The men were shooting across the bridge at whatever they could see, all of them waiting for the bridge to finally explode. It was around 3.50 p.m. when Battalion Commander Major Murray Devers approached, informing Timmerman that the bridge is likely to explode at 4 p.m., leaving them under 10 minutes. Devers, knowing Hoge's sudden change in strategy, informs Timmerman that they want to take the bridge, and establish a bridgehead on the eastern banks. Timmerman was unsure what to make of this, and Devers point-blank asks him, Do you think we can get your company across the bridge? Timmerman looks across to the eastern side, seeing the machine-gun nests in the barricades and the formidable German defenses on the towers. 
his men would be funneled down a long, narrow pathway, creating a horrific sight if he were to cross. But here was a bridge still intact. Could the Americans really pass up a chance like this to finally cross into Germany? Well, we can try, sir, Timmerman responds. Devers nods. Go ahead. He begins to walk away when Timmerman shouts after him. What if the bridge blows up in my face? Devers does not give Timmerman an answer and keeps walking away. With his orders to cross the bridge, Timmerman informs his badly undermanned unit that they were about to cross the bridge and to be ready to move along the left and right sides to begin removing the explosives lining it. They prepare, loading their rifles and submachine guns, knowing full well that once on the bridge, there was no turning back. Either they would successfully remove the explosives and establish a bridgehead, or die in the explosion once the Germans detonate the charges. Timmerman stands, the time running out, begins to order his men to advance when... Corporal Anton Faust had reached his objective, lighting the fuse, the bridge going up in smoke, the earth quaking all around the German and Americans on either side of the river. Most of the men hit the dirt, covering their heads. General Hoge watched with great sadness as the bridge fell out of sight, the smoke too immense for him to see through it. However, the Rhine's wind began to blow the smoke and dust away, soldiers on both sides slowly coming to after the shocks began to subside, only for everyone to look in utter shock, horror, and excitement, depending on which side you were on. Hoge looks through his binoculars and smiles. The Ludendorff Bridge still stands. Interview with Captain Willy Bratka. Instinctively, my hand comes to my neck. I know. If the bridge doesn't go down into the water, my life will be at stake. Something has to happen. I rush back to Major Schoeller and report to him. Demolition of the bridge has failed. But I had hardly reached him when someone called again through the tunnel. Captain Bradke, come back, Commander, up front. It grows louder and louder. Major Schiller says, have a look what is going on. Again, I run back through the tunnel, through the masses of civilians, passing men, women, children. Soldiers are amongst them. I reach Friesen. Friesen Hahn already shouts, Americans across the bridge. Timmerman watches as the smoke clears, can see Germans on the eastern banks running about, knows they will probably try to blow the bridge again, has no idea if there are more detonation charges under the bridge or not. They had to move, and they had to move right now. He stands in front of his ragtag troops and shouts, Forward! Onto the bridge! He leads the way, his troops moving through the smoke, many getting their grenades ready to lop them at the eastern defenses, Germans firing several MG42s at them, rifles coming alive and barking, tracers flying all around them. The Americans begin firing more smoke to help blind the Germans, and Timmerman and his forces disappear somewhere towards the middle of the Ludendorff Bridge. Now all the Americans could do was watch in anticipation. Would their boys succeed or not? Before we can continue this story, we must first jump back to before World War I. Field Marshal Count von Schlieffen, the architect of the dreadful Schlieffen plan, knew that with the increasing size of the German army, it would be necessary to construct a series of bridges across the Rhine. These would need to be strong enough to handle thousands of troops, trucks, heavy guns, and trains for a new kind of army the world had never seen before. Karl Weiner submitted one such bridge to be built near Bonn and Vermagen, and designed for a railroad bridge as early as 1912. This bridge had one principal purpose. On paper, it would connect the Eastern and Western Rhine Railway and Our Valley Railways to make transporting goods and supplies easier for the nearby townships. However, the real reason was evident to anyone who was there putting the plans in place. It was built to help speed up the war effort in an upcoming fight with France. By 1916, General Ludendorff, who had been a loyal aide-de-camp to Schlieffen prior to World War I, was the most vocal advocate for the bridge's construction, 
So much so, it would be decided to name the bridge after him. To help build the bridge, Russian prisoners were brought to the Western Front, and they worked day and night, slowly constructing a formidable bridge across the Rhine. The main part of the bridge formed a 1,066-foot-long steel structure, which consisted of the central two-hinged truss arc bridge, flanked on both sides by parallel anchor arms. The arch span was 511 foot long, with arms, each measuring 278 feet. The highest point of the arch bridge was 93 feet above the water. The height above the normal water level of the Rhine was 48 feet. In total, the Ludendorff Bridge was a total of 4,640 tons, and would cost Germany approximately 2.1 million marks. It was constructed with military use in mind. Thus, the foundations were heavily fortified with four towers. These towers, two on the east bank and two on the west, were full of loopholes for rifles and machine guns. They were also large enough for armament storage and other requisitions for the bridge detail. An entire battalion could be housed within these fortifications. From these towers, the defenders had a stunning look over the beautiful valley before them, almost making one forget that this bridge was constructed to perpetuate war. Because the Ludendorff Bridge was a natural military target, the engineers were tasked with designing and implementing a way to destroy it in the case of an invasion. The two bridge piers were built as hollow shells, complete with demolition chambers. Explosives could be installed at the base of the piers in case it came under attack. Electrical circuits, protected by steel tubing, had been included so engineers could detonate the bridge from the safety of the rail tunnel beneath the tunnel on the eastern bank. Despite significant measures to construct the bridge on time and on schedule, the Great War ultimately ended, and construction would not be completed until 1919. The French were the first to occupy the bridge, and they discovered how the Germans wanted to destroy it. In response, they filled these detonation chambers with concrete, which, ironically, made the bridge's foundation stronger. It would be easy to forget that the Ludendorff Bridge was built for war if a civilian lived in Bonn and Remagen between 1919 and 1938. Karl Wehner's elegant, symmetrical, yet simplistic design made the Ludendorff Bridge a beautiful sight for anyone living in or visiting the surrounding area. It had two railway lines, and people could come to and fro, enjoying the beautiful German scenery and the Rhine itself. Foreigners became easier to transport over the Rhine, and the bridge significantly improved the economies of both the eastern and western towns. Come see the Ludendorff Bridge, a marvel of German engineering and artistry. The two railways were constantly in use carrying passengers to and from, and below the bridge, small yachts brought tourists, locals, and lovers, all in awe of the visual splendor of the area and the engineering marvel which stood above them. But for German generals and strategists, the Ludendorff Bridge always retained its true purpose. By 1938, Nazi Germany was gearing up for a war, and German engineers raced to the Ludendorff Bridge to refix proper explosives in the case of an invasion. On the eastern banks stood a deep, dark tunnel. Here, control switches to detonate the bridge were laid, and the tunnel formed a natural bunker against Allied air raids. However, in 1938, air raids seemed so far away, and even as the Second World War began and the years ticked by, Hermann Goering said, If a bomb falls on Berlin, you can call me Herr Meyer. Most of Germany's cities had been bombed into oblivion. In the fall of 1944, the German army on the Western Front was in full retreat, as troops and civilians alike sought a way to retreat into the heart of Germany. The Ludendorff Bridge became a paramount in transporting supplies across the Rhine and refugees and wounded soldiers back to apparent safety. This fact was not lost on Allied reconnaissance. American bombers had begun bombing Bonn and Remagen in response to the large numbers of retreating German soldiers in that sector. The Germans were obviously using the Ludendorff Bridge mainly for troop transport, thus its destruction became a necessity. The 9th U.S. Air Force conducted a series of daytime bomb runs on the railroad crossing at Dusseldorf, Cologne, Remagen, and Koblenz. The destruction was predominantly urban, and German engineers were quickly dispatched to the Ludendorff Bridge for repairs. It had taken a series of hits during these air raids. Still, it remained a beacon of hope for any German civilian or wounded soldier seeking safety on the eastern banks. On October 19, 1944, just days after the Mulheim Bridge went up in smoke in Cologne, 
the Ludendorff Bridge suffered its greatest wound thus far. American bombs created several holes in the bridge, leaving it impassable for two weeks. Yet despite the damage and the constant travel going east and west, the Ludendorff Bridge remained standing, almost stubbornly, in defiance of American bombs. Even as Americans approached the bridge in 1945 and the explosives lined for the Ludendorff Bridge's demolition detonated, it remained a testament to human engineering. It was built too well for its own purpose and it remained stubbornly as if a purpose in itself as one of the last vestiges linking the eastern and western banks of the Rhine River. But come March 7, 1945, the Ludendorff Bridge was not just transporting Germans, but now Americans. Lieutenant Carl Timmerman, astonished the Ludendorff Bridge had not collapsed, ordered his hodgepodge of American soldiers forward. He had yet to learn whether the Germans had more explosives ready or not. Thus the time was now, and he and his soldiers began their mad dash up and over the bridge. Machine guns came alive again, the familiar bark of MG-42s in the towers overlooking the bridge. But these men could not stop. If they did, they ran the risk of getting pinned down in the middle of a bridge, probably rigged with further explosives. He could see that the prior detonation had left giant holes scattered across the makeshift patching the Germans had placed earlier. This made crossing even more of a challenge, mixed with the heavy smoke screen the American artillery was laying toward the eastern tunnel entrance. Sure enough, about two-thirds of the explosives Captain Fries and Hahn rigged had not detonated. Timmerman ordered half of his men to remove the demolition charges below the bridge, while the other half were to move down the catwalk on the left side. Under the bridge, those moving on the catwalk began to jump from pillar to pillar, the occasional bullet ricocheting off the metal. A platoon of American soldiers had also captured and secured the two towers on the western side, and they set up machine guns to give their men further cover. Timmerman decided to help remove the explosives, arguably the most dangerous part of the bridge crossing. There, he found himself with four other random soldiers who had scurried across and into the center of the bridge, like he had. These men were Lieutenant Hugh Mott, Sergeant Eugene Dorland, and Sergeant John Reynolds. Together, they hurriedly began removing the dozens of explosives lining the underside of the Ludendorff Bridge, cutting the wires and physically removing the explosives by hand. John W. Mitchell, an eyewitness to the event, described Timmerman cutting the wires. Quote, While we were running across the bridge, and man, it may have been only 250 yards, but it seemed like 250 miles to us. I had spotted this lieutenant standing out there completely exposed to the machine gun fire that was pretty heavy by this time. He was cutting wires and kicking the German demolition charges off the bridge with his feet. Boy, that took plenty of guts. He was the one who saved the bridge and made the whole thing possible. While this happened, the first American soldier stepped off the bridge and onto the eastern banks. This was Sergeant Alexander Drabik, and he, inadvertently, was the first enemy soldier to step foot across the Rhine since the Napoleonic Wars. He quickly took cover in a ditch as German sniper fire riddled overhead. He said, quote, We ran down the middle of the bridge, shouting as we went. I didn't stop, because I knew if I kept moving, they couldn't hit me. My men were in squad column, and not one of them was hit. We took cover in some bomb craters. Then we just sat and waited for others to come. That's the way it was. Sergeant Joseph Delizio was another one of the first Americans to reach the eastern side of the Rhine. His biggest fear was that the Germans would still blow the bridge with many of his men in the middle of it. He had run as fast as he could. He ran into the leading unit, which had slowed considerably from constant sniper and machine gun fire. Delizio urged them forward until reaching the left tower on the eastern side of the Rhine. He heard someone shout, Who has the right tower? Nobody moved. Many were too afraid to run to the opposite side of the bridge. But Delizio felt he had no other choice. He scurried to the right side amidst heavy fire and reached the right tower. From there, he pushed the wooden door in and was greeted by five terrified Germans. He described them as huddled around a machine gun. Evidently, it had jammed. A common problem for the MG-42. Delicio fires a couple of shots to scare these men and yells, Unterhalt! German for hands up. These Germans, 
who were already wounded, immediately threw their hands up and surrendered. Delisio knew the machine gun could still cause a problem, and he was still by himself, so he moved over to it and kicked the MG-42 into the river. Unable to speak German, Delisio tried to ask if there were any other Germans upstairs. Either the prisoners did not understand or lied, but they told him no. Not believing them, Delisio decided he had to go to the upper levels. However, no other support had come as of yet. He used the German prisoners as a shield, feeling he had no other choice, and slowly crept up the stairs, his gun on the prisoners' backs. Here, Delisio found a lieutenant and another enlisted soldier. The lieutenant dove for the tower's corner, but Delisio was too quick, and he fired two shots and stopped the German. The lieutenant, being no fool, immediately surrendered. By now, reinforcements had come, and they took the prisoners from Delisio. He could now get back to advancing. With the two towers now in American hands, this meant that the Germans no longer had their strongest element of defense, and the Americans were now only feet from the entrance of the railroad tunnel. Delisio and a few of his men ducked into a crater and lobbed several grenades. Despite there being civilians inside, the Americans had no other choice. The German soldiers intermingled with them too much, the chaos too great. They had no clue how many people were in there. The tunnel was dark, and they heard more shouting. But were they civilians or soldiers? Delisio didn't want to take any chances and threw a couple more grenades deep into the tunnel. Inside the tunnel, Captains Willy Bratka, Karl Friesenhahn, and Major Hans Scheller tried to assess the situation. Interview with Captain Willy Bratka. Come on, Friesenhahn. A few men from the Sapper unit. Counterattack. There can be many of them. We have to throw them back. But uh, I've already tried it. We wanted to get out immediately. But look, the tremendous gunfire aimed at the entrance of the tunnel. One grenade after another. You can't subject anybody to that. No one will get out alive. Reason had there is only one possibility. Escape through the other end of the tunnel, across the dam, a counterattack. The Americans have to retreat. Both Bratka and Friesenhahn rushed back to Major Scheller, who was close to the other end of the tunnel. They give a scurried report about the Americans forming a bridgehead, and if they are to act, they need to do it now, while there are not too many of them across. However, the forces the Germans have at the present were just not sufficient. They pleaded with Scheller to prepare a counterattack and, more importantly, to get the civilians out of the eastern side of the tunnel. Here, Scheller decided that he had to get reinforcements. Still, there was no car or vehicle, and American artillery fire had grown by the second. He runs to find a radio or a telephone to no avail. Both had been shot, leaving the Germans no way to communicate with anyone outside of the tunnel. Using the bicycle he had arrived on, Scheller mounted it and prepared to leave to get the necessary reinforcements. Scheller, under heavy fire, began to pedal towards 67th Corps headquarters. However, he failed to inform Bratka and Friesenhahn of what he was doing, which left both men at a loss as to who was in charge or where Scheller had gone. It is unknown why Scheller left without a word, perhaps from sheer inexperience of command, or it was just panic within the heat of the moment. However, this left Bratka at a total loss of words and direction. At the bridge, more and more Americans pulled into the small bridgehead on the eastern side. A panicked Bratka found Friesenhahn inside the tunnel, and he explained that Schellard had disappeared. He was nowhere to be found. Now it was their job to gather all the men inside the tunnel out of Vermagen, move east, and prepare to launch their own counterattack. There was no other alternative, especially since most men probably knew that they would be sentenced to death once Hitler learned about their situation. Friesenhahn agreed with Bratka, and both men began to shout over the constant fire from the Americans to the west. They tried to separate the soldiers from the civilians the best they could, and made their way to the eastern entrance of the tunnel. Suddenly, hand grenades landed directly in front of them, and they exploded. People screamed, several soldiers hit. The stench of blood filled the tunnel. Machine gun fire followed, and it quickly dawned on both captains that the Americans had crossed the hilltop and onto the other side of the tunnel. They were trapped inside, and civilians had been caught in the crossfire. Here, the civilians panicked, and a riot inside the tunnel started. And again, the hand grenades roared down from the tunnel. And at a distance of approximately 120 meters in front of us, a machine gun fires right into the tunnel. Now suddenly there are screams coming from behind us. We turn around and go back. 
There are casualties among the civilians. A man, a child, a bullet wound in the stomach, a gunshot in the leg. The civilians are excited. They scream. They cling to the soldiers, grab them and take away their arms. They come to me. Combat commander, order a ceasefire. Stop it. Our women, our children. I too have a wife at home. Brodka had what could be interpreted as a small mental breakdown, and he grew silent. What could he do? He seemed in a trance as more American gunfire was coming down the tunnel, and more civilians screamed, German soldiers unable to fire back. Brodka then announces that he will stand down and asks any German if they would take command in his stead. No one volunteered. Many were probably flabbergasted. Their superior appeared to be frozen in place. Even if someone had, civilians forced their hand. They had begun to hoist white flags up on either end of the tunnel. There was no hope for a counterattack anymore. The only choice they had now was to surrender, and Brodka gave the order. They began to wave the white flag, and Americans at the eastern entrance of the tunnel started to shout and radioed in, Cease fire! Cease fire! As civilians and soldiers pulled out of the tunnel, the Americans got a good look at how scraggly and disheveled their enemy was. Then, from the darkness inside the tunnel, Bratka and Friesenhan exited with their hands over their heads, the last to leave the tunnel and surrender. Outside, Friesenhan looked up at the massive hill overlooking the tunnel and was stunned. He asked, How did they do it? How did these Yanks get from the bridge to the exit of the tunnel so fast? He admitted later how in awe he was of the American troops, especially Carl Timmerman. Both Friesenhan and Timmerman locked eyes for a moment, their respect instant. Friesenhan, the 50-year-old World War I veteran, and Timmerman, the German emigre to America, and a young officer. Brodka asked Timmerman if he could get some of his belongings from one of the towers. Timmerman, who spoke fluent German, denied his request. No. Take what you've got in your hand and get going. The peace did not last long, as sniper fire began further down the line. German forces scattered about by Remagen had collected themselves enough to begin properly pestering the American foothold. Most notably, snipers became a problem, which bogged down the American forces a great deal and would hamper any attempts to try and fix the devastated Ludendorff Bridge. Nevertheless, Colonel Angerman radioed to General Hoge. Bridge intact. Am pushing bulldozers to the other side. What are your plans? Advise as quickly as possible. Time was of the essence here, as the small foothold was slender at best, and the next few hours would be desperate for them, unless the Americans could get more troops and armor across the bridge. The artillery on the western side of the Rhine began preparations in the event of a night bombardment. Everyone knew that the Germans would likely organize a proper counterattack. Only about 120 men, including Timmerman, had established the bridgehead on the eastern side. As Ken Hetchler, a reporter who witnessed these events, put it, this was a pretty thin force to hold a strategic point like that. General William Hoge overlooked the soldiers charging over the bridge through his binoculars. He could barely make out what was happening through the thick smoke the American artillery was laying on the eastern banks of the Rhine River. That was when he received word from headquarters that Combat Command Company B was to head south, cross the Aura River toward Koblenz, and join up with Patton's Third Army, per Eisenhower's original plan. Allied command had no inkling what was happening here. News had yet traveled to their headquarters, so they were completely blind as to what William Hoge was formulating. This put Hoge in an awkward position, and he could not feasibly see a way to pull out of his current predicament. As said before, Hoge wanted a bridge across the Rhine. Seeing the Ludendorff Bridge was too good of an opportunity to pass up, so he made a decision that could risk his entire career. In his decision to capture the Ludendorff Bridge, General William Hoge directly disobeyed orders. Now, as his troops continue to funnel their way across to capture the bridge, he radios into Allied headquarters and reports the situation. He returns to his command and calls General Hodges directly to report what was happening. General Courtney Hodges was excited over the news, much to Hodges' relief and the plan began to fall into place. 
Hodges agreed with General Hoge that they needed to cancel the prior order of operation and begin channeling their forces to Remagen. But to do this, he needed permission from General Omar Bradley, who in turn required consent from General Dwight D. Eisenhower. General Bradley was sitting in his headquarters looking over the reports from the previous day. He had yet to learn that General Hoge had done anything at Remagen, let alone found a bridge, and was in the process of taking it. He then received a call from General Hodges. He became excited over the prospect of the American army capturing a bridge. General Harold Pinky Bull was with him, a man from Eisenhower's staff. Bull, who had heard of the situation at Remagen, needed to be more convinced of its significance. He told Bradley, You're not going anywhere down there at Remagen. You've got a bridge, but it's in the wrong place. It just doesn't fit in with the plan. Bradley, though, understood the significance of taking the bridge and what this could mean for the future operations on the American front and their planned invasion of Germany. Excitedly, and with a bit of frustration, Bradley replied, What the hell do you want us to do? Pull back and blow it up? There were, admittedly, some ulterior motives behind Bradley's enthusiasm. Remember, Bradley favored an American-led, broader front offensive across the Rhine. Securing the bridge at Remagen would allow the Americans to initiate such a plan. It would force the decision to make a broad front offensive necessary for General Eisenhower. Interview with General Omar Bradley. When I received this uh, phone call from Hodges, uh, it was one of the best pieces of news we'd received for some time. It was a great satisfaction that we had been able to capture this bridge, and I expect I was somewhat excited about it. As soon as I finished talking to Hodges, I called Eisenhower. He was very excited about it, and uh, we both realized this is very fine news. It would save us the trouble and expense and casualties of making an assault crossing of the Rhine, and it really was uh, one of the nicest things that happened to us during this period. Eisenhower shouted with glee at hearing of the Remagen crossing. He gave Bradley and Hodges permission to take the remaining units in Cologne, which had recently been captured, and send them straight to Remagen hastily. He said, quote, To hell with the planners. Sure, go on, Brad. I'll give you every one we got to hold that bridgehead. We'll make good use even if the terrain isn't too good. Word then traveled from Eisenhower to Bradley, from Bradley to Hodges, and then from Hodges to Hoge. Cross the bridge and push as far as possible. First Lieutenant Windsor Miller, a tanker and engineer present at Remagen, began to furiously work to fill in Captain Friesenhan's crater. Everyone seemed shocked that the Ludendorff Bridge remained standing after taking such a beating. It was littered with holes, much of the wooden planks placed by the Germans destroyed. Its foundations had been thoroughly rocked, and most Americans waited with bated breath for the bridge to collapse into the Rhine. But the bridge remained by nightfall, and hundreds of engineers poured onto it with the tools necessary to make proper repairs, even if everything was crude. Miller was called into a meeting with all the officers about their future actions. It was decided that they would attempt to cross the Ludendorff Bridge with their tanks, which were mainly M4 Shermans with four new Pershing heavy tanks. None of these men knew whether the badly wounded bridge would have the strength to hold them. But the infantry needed armor support on the other side, and we had to make an effort to get our tanks over there. The Sherman tanks made their way to the bridge and, in a single row, crept their way across it. And they were lined up end to end, to which Miller shouted to the tank in front of him, Don't get too far away. The man in front of him turned back to stare at him. Sir, I can't very well get too far away with you bumping into me all the time. Eventually, Miller's nine Sherman tanks crossed the bridge by some miracle. They were the first American tanks across the Rhine. Behind them was an M-10 tank destroyer, and they heard a loud crash. It had fallen partially through the bridge. William Hoge described the scene as such. It just stuck there and blocked the bridge. So we had a hell of a fix there, and you couldn't move the damn thing. It couldn't move under its own power. And I told them that cut it loose and let it drop into the river. It didn't make any difference. I had to get rid of it because it was blocking the traffic of the reinforcements and everything. Well, they couldn't do that. So they finally sent a tank back from the far side, and the east side of the Rhine, and hooked a cable to the front end of the tank destroyer and pulled it out. And that opened up the bridge. 
Then the traffic began to flow. We took the infantry across. The tank destroyer was successfully moved at around 5.30 a.m. on March 8th. With the M10 crashing through the bridge, it was quickly decided to keep the Pershings on the western side of the Rhine, where they would serve as artillery. But this also revealed a more pressing issue. The Ludendorff Bridge was in shambles and needed to be fixed before any heavy equipment could adequately make its way across. Thus, pontoon bridges were necessary, and engineers rushed to Remagen to begin construction as others ran onto the Ludendorff Bridge to begin repairs. As early as 4 o'clock a.m. on March 8th, American engineers began makeshift repairs on the bridge. Cranes, trucks, and other vehicles moved back and forth on the bridge, carrying the necessary supplies to keep the bridge up and make it usable. The continued German bombardment and airstrikes did not make their lives any easier, either on the pontoon bridge or the Ludendorff Bridge. Around 200 engineers were on the Ludendorff Bridge, working furiously to keep it open so their soldiers on the eastern side of the Rhine would not be cut off. Nevertheless, troops could still cross on foot, and the rest of Combat Command B did so. Several anti-aircraft guns had been wheeled into place come midnight, March 8th, and artillery battalions were placed along the river to prepare for any counter-bombardments. Naturally, the atmosphere was tense. The Germans could strike and stifle what little they had across the Rhine at any moment. The engineers had to work, and work fast, all through the night, using giant heavy searchlights as their primary means of visibility. Disorganized local German forces, the only Germans in the area abundant enough to launch a counteroffensive, began to pick up their attacks. They aimed to blow up the bridge far more than necessarily driving the Americans back. With less than 120 infantry on the eastern side of the Rhine, Miller's tanks became especially vulnerable during the night. Germans with Panzerfaust would approach undetected, then fire up close. Luckily, the Shermans had mounted machine guns on them, providing enough firepower to break off many of these isolated German attacks. Yet no major offensive had started. The ferocity of German resistance began to pick up, and Miller radioed into Colonel Engemann how desperate their situation was. They needed medical supplies and ammo, and the Germans clearly understood how tentative the American foothold was. Engemann radioed back, Hold your place until the last tank is shot out from under you. Major August Kraft and Herbert Strobel were the closest German forces to Remagen as the Americans crossed. And they learned of its capture at around 11 o'clock p.m. on March 7th. But what were these men going to do? First, they were not placed in charge of the Ludendorff Bridge, Captain Friesenhahn was. And second, their battalion was spread over a 45-mile front. They only heard of the bridge being captured from word of mouth by local civilians. Major Strobel immediately contacted Kraft and ordered him to supply around 1,000 kilograms of explosives within the hour. He was to then personally make an inspection of the other smaller bridges before the Americans could discover them. Strobel then hung up and quickly gathered whatever forces he could to launch a counterattack. As ordered, Strobel had gathered around 100 Volkssturm and engineers. They launched a brief attack and challenged the 120 Americans across the bridge. They had fought valiantly, some even making it to the Ludendorff Bridge and detonating the explosives, others successfully knocking out several Shermans, which the Americans desperately needed for support. But it was not enough. Strobel ordered the withdrawal after putting up a tremendous fight, succeeding at making 100 men feel like a thousand. Several others were captured, most notably the wounded. Strobel's men in no condition to carry them back. Overall command of Army Group B on the Western Front was Field Marshal Walter Model, one of Hitler's most trusted supporters and battlefield officers. Throughout March 7th and into March 8th, he organized retreats across the Rhine. Specifically, many German troops had been stranded on the western banks. He considered these troops his highest priority, needing them for the defense of Germany. When he learned of Remagen, Model was enraged, immediately placed General Joachim Kreuzfleisch in charge of recapturing and destroying the Ludendorff Bridge. Kreuzfleisch could only divert a small number of men immediately, as most of the troops were already preoccupied with their slow retreat into Germany, but he gathered elements of the 15th Army from the west side of the Rhine. The only others he could find were a few anti-aircraft forces, Hitler Youth, 
Volkssturm, and local police units, all of which could do little against the Americans. To further complicate their issue, the German command structure had utterly broken down. Who was in charge of what? One of their generals had even been captured as early as March 6th without anyone noticing. General Fritz Bayerlein, who served as General Erwin Rommel's chief of staff in Africa, was placed in charge of the nearby Panzerlehrer Division, German Armored Division. These soldiers did have a reputation for being a formidable fighting force with elite, well-trained, and battle-hardened men under their command. They numbered around 5,000 men, 55 tanks, and 30 artillery pieces, all assigned from other sectors to drive back the American bridgehead. Drama immediately started between Bayerlein and Model. Being Hitler's watchdog, Model pushed Bayerlein to attack immediately, despite his forces being scattered, tired, and undersupplied. Bayerlein made the case that their lack of fuel would make things difficult. It would be best to wait and attack all at once, hard and heavy, instead of piecemeal. Both men knew that with every second that passed, more Americans would funnel across the Ludendorff Bridge, and they would become harder to check. In fact, come daytime on March 8th, the Americans had 8,000 soldiers across the bridge and began to push into Germany. Several German generals had reached out to Major Strobel, who had continued to harangue as many troops as possible to counter the expanding American bridgehead. He was ordered to continue his counterattacks despite his undermanned and outgunned forces, but these orders conflicted. This was the ultimate breakdown in German command. General Richard Wirtz, Modell's Army Group B engineer officer, wanted Strobel to use local ferries to float boats down the Rhine and place other explosives on the bridge. Then there was General Kurtz von Berg, supposedly the officer in charge of building defenses on the eastern side of the Rhine. Quote, he thought the engineers should be used as infantry to counterattack and wipe out the American bridgehead. To Strobel's credit, he did put up a defiant effort and did succeed at making the Americans' lives hell that first night. It just wasn't enough. Alfred Jodl awoke Hitler at around 8 o'clock a.m. on March 8, 1945, and informed him of the loss of the Ludendorff Bridge. As expected, Hitler grew furious at learning of this defeat, and wanted all those responsible strung up. Joseph Goebbels described the situation in his diary, quote, In the evening comes the news that it has still not been possible to eliminate the Remagen Bridgehead. On the contrary, the Americans have reinforced it and are trying to extend it. The result is a very unpleasant situation for us. However, we must succeed, for if the Americans continue to hold out on the right bank of the Rhine, they have a base for a further advance, and from the small beginnings of a bridgehead such as we now see, a running sore will develop, as so often before, the poison from which will soon spread to the Reich's vitals. Throughout March 8th and 9th, the Germans had wheeled several medium and heavy artillery units, which constantly bombarded the bridge in hopes of collapsing it, and Hitler intended to increase their firepower. Hitler suddenly saw Remagen as the key to the entire Western Front, and he wanted any and all resources pooled into that sector to stop the Americans from advancing any further. It was March 9th when Model and OKW began to formulate a proper plan to combat the bridgehead. A whole two days after the bridge had been captured. They thought there was still time to re-strengthen their weakened forces, who proved again they were stronger on paper than in reality, while also focusing their efforts on Remagen. Trains brought forward railguns, which began to lob shells at the Ludendorff Bridge and the American engineers who desperately began building a separate pontoon bridge across the Rhine. Hermann Goering also personally got involved, committing much of the Luftwaffe, which was a pale comparison to what it was initially. Eight Stukas began to dive-bomb the Ludendorff and pontoon bridges. However, the natural surrounding terrain at Remagen made this problematic. The hills on either side of the Rhine meant the Stukas could only come from one direction, to which the Americans were ready with hordes of anti-aircraft guns. Despite a couple of bombs striking the Ludendorff bridge, it remained standing. V-2 rockets were then diverted and were to be used on the bridge. Many of Hitler's staff were appalled by this decision, knowing that these wonder weapons were highly inaccurate. 
they would likely kill more German civilians than American soldiers. That is precisely what happened. One V-2 rocket landed as far away as Cologne. However, of the eleven V-2s fired, several landed near the Ludendorff Bridge, creating great panic for the Americans. Other planes began their bombing of the Ludendorff Bridge, such as the Junker Ju-88s and the more famous ME-262s. No expense was spared in the hopes of stopping the Americans and collapsing the Ludendorff Bridge. Despite the thick anti-aircraft fire, the funneled streets on either side of the Rhine made troops and vehicles easy targets. The air raids alone destroyed 256 mortar transports and damaged 35 American tanks and 12 other armored vehicles. German artillery fire on the Ludendorff Bridge had only increased by March 10, 1945. At around noon, a shell struck a gasoline truck, and for the next two days, the Americans were forced to send gasoline over the Rhine by barges and ferries, which greatly hampered their ability to advance. Because of the hilly terrain surrounding Remagen, the German artillery spotters had a field day knocking out American targets, such as troop transports, tanks, and soldiers. In total, during the heaviest of the artillery bombardment, the Ludendorff Bridge withstood another 24 direct hits, and still it stood, littered with engineers and troops headed to the eastern banks. The artillery fire had grown so intense that there would be an explosion on the road of the western bank every 30 seconds. One road in particular earned the nickname Dead Man's Corner. Anyone traveling would see a warning sign. This street subject to enemy shell fire. The sign did not exaggerate. It was a perfect choke point for the German artillery to exploit. Trucks would push other trucks to the side of the road in a desperate attempt to get off Dead Man's Corner. Jeeps exploded, bodies disappearing upon impact. It became necessary for medics to remove the dead bodies as quickly as possible to maintain American morale. Still, even though this was put on hold, German firepower was too great. B.C. Henderson described the situation as such, quote, When the orders were given to go, it meant don't stop for anything or anybody. We could not even assist the wounded. This seemed cold and inhuman, as our buddies were our life. When we reached the ramp, it was more understandable why we could not stop. That ramp became known as Dead Man's Corner for a good reason. As we ran toward the bridge, we stepped and jumped over the dead and wounded. It was obvious why we could not clog the traffic. The engineers on the pontoon bridges would make headway, only for an artillery round to explode before them, killing fellow soldiers and destroying any progress made. They became a target the moment the engineers got to work. Nevertheless, by March 11th, at 5.10 a.m., the first pontoon bridge was complete, and heavy equipment could now cross the Rhine. Another was finished at 7 o'clock p.m. further up the river. Over 2,500 vehicles then went over the Rhine to further the American breakout. A decision was then made to close the Ludendorff Bridge completely, so that way proper repairs could be made relatively unabated. Despite several pontoon bridges, the Ludendorff Bridge remained the best chance of getting heavy equipment across the river, both to and from, and at once, while the pontoons remained one-directional. As engineers rushed to the sagging Ludendorff Bridge, they calculated it had fallen between 6 to 10 inches from the constant traffic, failed detonations, bombs, and artillery fire. Yet, somehow, it remained standing, and was responsible for getting the necessary American reinforcements across the Rhine before the Germans could repel them. Walter Model also ordered a halt to any general offensive. He decided it best, having now seen how depleted his forces actually were. The best that Army Group B could do was halt the American advance. With over 25,000 Americans now across the Rhine, numerous German forces needed to help repel Montgomery in the north, and Patton in the south were diverted. Any hopes that the German army could regroup to establish a deep defense strategy, as initially proposed, had vanished. This also put a sharp halt on any initiative the Germans might have had, and foiled any chances of pushing back the Americans. Hitler resorted to his tried-and-true loyalty method after his assassination attempt in July 1944. He wanted heads to roll, and immediately sought out those who were responsible. One of the first victims was General von Bothmer, who was in charge of the defenses at Bonn. 
Hitler blamed Bothmer for losing the Ludendorff Bridge, despite Bothmer having nothing to do with the bridge's defenses. A makeshift court sentenced Bothmer to five years in prison and a demotion to private. Bothmer did not satisfy Hitler and shot himself in response to the sentencing. It became clear that Hitler's echelon suspected some semblance of sabotage and cowardice, the paranoia of the July plot still present. Goebbels noted, It must be assumed that the failure to blow up the Remagen Bridge may well be due to sabotage, or at least serious negligence. The Führer has ordered an inquiry and will impose a death sentence on anyone found guilty. Next, Hitler summoned the loyal and fanatical Nazi general Rudolf Ubner from the Eastern Front. He arrived in Berlin on March 10, 1945. Ubner would be given a small military tribunal, and Hitler gave the general full authority to arrest, try, and convict anyone responsible for the bridge's loss. German military law stated that all those charged had the right to a tribunal. However, Hitler overstepped those rules and gave Ubner his own execution squad to accompany him. News of Ubner's arrival sent shockwaves through Germany's military leadership, and many began to look for scapegoats instead of owning their own mistakes. Hitler had created the ultimate aura of paranoia, that any German officer could be strung up and hanged by piano wire at any moment. At the same time Ubner arrived in Berlin, Major Scheller had arrived at 67th Corps HQ. Model and Hitzfeld were both present and summoned the Major to give a report about what happened at Vermagen. Scheller must have understood what was probably coming for him, but complied and described precisely what occurred on March 7th. But why did you leave the bridge? Model asked. I grabbed the bicycle and went to try and get help, Scheller replied. Why didn't you telephone for help, or at least organize a counterattack? Scheller knew Modal was looking for a scapegoat, but continued. The telephone was out, and I thought it was important that higher headquarters get news of the situation. Why did it take three days for you to get back here from Remagen? Why did you desert your unit? Here Modal was justified in his anger. Scheller seemed to utterly disappear once he left the tunnel, and he did not help Major Strobel or Kraft. Scheller replied, Field Marshal. I was commandeered to hold a roadblock. Then when I tried to get back to my corps, it had moved command posts. I did my best. Model had none of this. Hitzfeld, who had sent Scheller to the Ludendorff Bridge in the first place, watched in silence. Here was a chance for Hitzfeld to stand up for the Major. But he said nothing, and was too afraid of Hitler's noose. Model rose and grabbed Scheller by his shoulder, to which he proclaimed, Here we have one who is guilty. Scheller had yet to learn about Uvner and his kangaroo court, yet he understood clearly he was already a dead man walking, and his immediate superior, General Hitzfeld, said nothing and left Scheller unarmed and defenseless to Hitler's thugs. Once Uvner arrived at Model's HQ, he was assigned a small staff, to which all of them remained silent as to Uvner's methods. However, all of them knew that what was happening was against German law and immoral. Here, generals were summoned to testify in front of Ubner's court instead of being out on the field in an attempt to retake Remagen. On March 11th, Scheller had been questioned by Ubner's men, but two others were summoned before the court, both Major Strobel and Kraft. Like Scheller, the court proclaimed that Strobel should have organized a counterattack immediately. Strobel protested this accusation, explaining he had done so when he and Kraft learned of the bridge's capture. His numbers were too small, and his men too ill-equipped to properly repel the American foothold, but Ubner had none of this. Major Kraft was confident he would be found innocent, as he followed Strobel's orders without question or hesitation. Before he drove off to his court-martial, he told his staff that he would be back before nightfall. At four o'clock p.m., in a farmhouse, the court-martial commenced. No formal records were kept except for the charges brought against the accused. Captain Brodka was the first to be tried in abstention. He was accused of delaying the Ludendorff Bridge's detonation. He was quickly found guilty and sentenced to death. Luckily for Brodka, he was an American prisoner of war. Modal's legal representatives began to protest, one even handing Ubner a copy of the German military code. 
Ubner waved it aside and said, The only authority I need is Hitler's. Model's representatives then went quiet. This moment, their only protest. Next, they brought in Major Scheller, to which Ubner remembered, quote, I am unable to say how long the trial against Scheller lasted, nor could I say how many times Scheller was heard. I admit, however, that I addressed Scheller roughly and angrily during the trial. That day, after little deliberation, Major Scheller and Lieutenant Karl Heinz Peters were given their sentences. We can make this short, Ubner said before reading the sentence. Both men were sentenced to be shot and led out of the farmhouse. Next, Major Croft and Strobel were summoned. Strobel and Croft went through much of the same as Scheller during their court-martial hearing on March 12, 1945. Both men fell victim to what was common in the German high command. What looked good on paper was different from reality. But this did not matter to Hitler or Ubner. To their shock, especially for Kraft, both men were also sentenced to death by firing squad. They were then dragged out of the farmhouse. Captain Friesen Hahn was tried next in absentia, in a similar vein to Captain Brodka. Out of all of those brought before the court, Friesen Hahn, despite being captured, was the only one found not guilty. It was likely because Friesen Hahn had been a loyal party member since 1933. At around 10 p.m., while Kraft and Strobel stood trial, Major Scheller and Lieutenant Peters prepared for their execution. They had been given just 30 minutes to write to their families before being handcuffed and forced outside. It had rained profusely the day before, the ground soaked, and a ten-man firing squad readied themselves. Scheller was forced to turn his back to them, like a coward he knew he wasn't, and he stood tall and defiantly, then was shot in the back of the neck. The letter he wrote to his family never reached them. It was torn up, and his body was looted. The next day, Majors Kraft and Strobel were handcuffed, and in much the same manner as Scheller, were led into the woods. They were also shot in the back of the necks, their bodies thrown in small graves less than ten inches deep. Their letters, too, were torn up, and their bodies looted. Most engineers marveled that the Ludendorff Bridge remained standing after months of aerial bombardments, artillery fire, heavy traffic, and a failed demolition. Captain Francis Goodwin, an engineer combat supply officer, stood on the bridge on March 17, 1945. His men were hard at work, with the proposed deadline to have the bridge back up and operational approaching fast. Before, he had witnessed two V-2 rockets land beside the bridge powerfully rocking its already weakened foundations. This sent nerves throughout the engineer corps, but they kept working, even as other German artillery fire rained upon them. Goodwin walked the railroad tunnel to investigate some German water supply equipment he had seen on the other end. Halfway through the tunnel, he realized he had forgotten his flashlight. Goodwin doubled back to see if he could borrow one from his fellow engineers on the bridge. His mind worked as an engineer should. He was calculating how much lumber was needed, where men were staking steel and the steel plates and wooden boards, what equipment would be needed to be wheeled onto the bridge to carry such supplies. He stopped momentarily and spoke with Major Carr, a commander of the 1058th Bridge Construction and Repair Team. They focused on the gap between the bridge where the demolition had failed. It was considerable, and currently the bridge's weakest point structurally. Carr estimated he would have the repair done by the end of the day, on time, and on schedule. Goodwin continued to the other side of the Ludendorff Bridge, where some welders were working furiously. He asked them if they had enough gas for the tools, and they assured Goodwin they did. He then watched a crane that was in the process of straightening out a truss. He never got his flashlight, nor returned to the tunnel on the eastern side. At around 3 o'clock p.m., everyone stopped what they were doing as they heard a low rumble from the bridge. Witnesses described sharp, rifle-like fire, and cables breaking loose. Then came a loud crack, and an integral rivet had sheared off. There was no time to shout any warnings, and the deck vibrated profusely. Everyone dropped their tools and began running, shouts of panic echoing through the surrounding area, and soldiers popping up to see what was happening. Dust began to rise from under the bridge, and there was no doubt to anyone watching what was happening. After taking such a brutal beating, the Ludendorff Bridge was about to collapse. Engineers suddenly found themselves running uphill instead of in a straight line. Then water rushed around them. 
Major Carr was washed and sunk down into the Rhine, where he died. Colonel Clayton A. Rust, the commanding officer of one of two units assigned to repair the bridge, described the following, quote, The water of the Rhine swirled around his knees, and in an instant he was engulfed. He had no sensation of falling, but one of the girders soon pinned him under water. How long he was held under, Colonel Rust did not know, but suddenly his trap was sprung, and he rose to the surface just as he felt his lungs would burst. The current then swept him down to the Treadway Bridge, where he was pulled from the Rhine, badly shaken, but not seriously hurt. A total of 23 engineers were killed, and another 63 injured. Eighteen of those killed were never found, and presumed to have drowned and swept up the Rhine River. In its stead, another pontoon bridge was to be built, and members of the 148th Engineer Combat Battalion went to work. To this day, the Ludendorff Bridge has never been rebuilt, and its ruins remain, a sharp reminder of what took place between March 5th and March 22nd, 1945. The battle at Remagen had a profound effect on the American war effort. Especially after the hell that was the Battle of the Bulge, the Battle of Remagen boosted American morale considerably. Between March 22nd and March 24th, 1945, the Allies officially invaded Germany. General Patton swept north from the south, and Field Marshal Montgomery moved in from the north. Strategically, capturing the Ludendorff Bridge had diverted precious resources the Germans did not have, making the overall Allied invasion a much easier affair. General George C. Marshall, the U.S. Army's Chief of Staff, put it best, quote, The bridgehead provided a serious threat to the heart of Germany, a diversion of incalculable value. It became a springboard for the final offensive to come. The Americans lost over 7,400 casualties between March 7th and March 24th, and 863 men died in the fighting. German losses vary wildly in numbers. However, what is known is that over 11,200 prisoners were captured between March 7th and March 14th. General Hoge was awarded the Oak Leaf Cluster as an addition to his Distinguished Service Medal for his decision to exploit the Ludendorff Bridge. Lieutenant Timmerman, Sergeant Drabik, Sergeants Joseph Delizio, Michael Shinchar, Joseph S. Petrensik, and Anthony Samelli were all rewarded for their brave actions with the Distinguished Service Cross, the highest award anyone in the Army could receive just under the Medal of Honor. Captain George P. Salmas, First Lieutenant C. Windsor Miller, Sergeant William J. Goodson, and First Lieutenant John Grimble from the 14th Tank Battalion, which brought the first tanks across the Ludendorff Bridge, were also awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. All these men showcased extraordinary bravery in the face of great adversity, proved calm under fire, and were instrumental in shortening the war in Europe by what experts believe to be a month. As for the Germans, the war would end just a few months later. The officers defending Remagen, such as Captain Bradka, Friesenhahn, and Major Scheller, were given an impossible task. Scheller paid the ultimate price because of it. Major Scheller and Lieutenants Kraft and Strobel, while making mistakes, followed their orders and fought the best they could under impossible odds, and were all unjustly murdered because their superior officers were too afraid to stand up for their own mistakes. In the cemetery of Bimbach, Germany, a memorial was erected that reads, In memory of Major Hans Scheller, Major Herbert Strobel, Major August Kraft, and Lieutenant Karl Heinz Peters, who fought for the bridge at Remagen, innocently sentenced to death. However, it, it's here that the author wishes to interject himself and break his own rule. So out of all the changing characters, out of all these people that come and go within the, the history of, at the Battle of Remagen, there's always one that is constant from beginning to end, and it's the Ludendorff Bridge. As I kept reading and researching this, because the story has always fascinated me, the, the, the tale of how the bridge was captured, how it fell, the battle that ensued around it, has always fascinated me, just as the final year of World War II has always fascinated me. I began to find myself looking at the Ludendorff Bridge, not as a bridge or as an objective, but as if it was a character within itself. It remained stubbornly standing there. It remained defiant. It remained strong. It was a true testament 
to human ingenuity. I mean, let's look at why it was built. I mean, it was built for the sole purpose of war, but yet it was completed when the war was over. And so instead of for war, it brought economic prosperity to the surrounding regions. Tourists could come in, people were going under the bridge just to marvel at its, at its beauty, at its simplistic design, only for it then to unfortunately revert back to its original purpose, which was war come 1938. It was meant to perpetuate the German war effort, but what happened? Instead, the bridge shortened the war. It shortened the war by as much as a month, as some experts have said. And yet, at the same time, I also can't help but think that despite being built for war, which war means destruction, it saved hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of lives, both German and American and British and Canadian, allied lives in general, by shortening the war. And it only fell when it simply could not take any more. And the storyteller in me, the, the, the guy who likes his stories, who likes thematic essences and stuff like that, which I don't really like to interject into my histories, but can't really help it here, I found myself caring for it and realized that, yes, this was the reason this entire thing happened, both literally and metaphorically. And because of that, I looked at it as a character within itself, and I still do, and I am extremely sentimental over it. That there's something more here than just a bridge. And it helped shorten the war and saved hundreds of lives. <laughs>